sources close to the Steinhoff investigation say that former CEO Marcus Joste is dead. He's believed to have shot himself during negotiations for his arrest. The Financial Sector Conduct Authority just yesterday slapping him with a 475 million rand fine for lying in Steinhoff's financial statements and annual reports. Joste was given four weeks to pay that penalty. Now, the local and international investors losing uh, just over 200 billion rand during Steinhoff's uh, 2017 collapse. This, is, uh, this was due to one of South Africa's uh, biggest accounting scandals. At least that's how it was billed at the time. Well, let's get reaction now, and uh, we speak to the author of The Biggest Corporate Crash, and uh, that's James Brent Stein. James, good evening to you, and uh, thank you for your time. Your reaction to this news tonight? Hi, uh, hi, Tony, and the viewers. Well, uh, it's, it's surprising. I, I wouldn't have thought this is the kind of guy to, to do this. Um, I mean, I, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I suppose... He's taking a lot of information uh, to the grave with him, and uh, it's a great pity that all the details never came out. So I suppose that's my immediate reaction. Yeah, and we're going to get into just some of the detail in your book, but as for the investigation, the Steinhoff investigation, is this the end of it, you think? As you say, he takes mm. a lot of secrets with him to the grave. Mm. Look, I, I hope not. I certainly hope not. And I do think there's, there's, there's a lot of very nervous people around tonight. One doesn't know whether Mr. Eustace wrote, wrote a letter, put a lot of stuff on a flash drive. You, there's a lot of stuff you can do today before you take an action like he did, allegedly did, uh, earlier today. So there might be a lot of nervous people around. One certainly hopes that the investigation doesn't stop. There's no way that uh, a scheme as elaborate as the one that uh, that collapsed with Steinhoff could have done, been you know, could have been orchestrated by one person. There's no way that only one person could have put together that intricate list of companies and dummy companies and all sorts of funny things. So, uh, I, you know, I do hope that, that that we do get some further clarification down the line, and, and I would most certainly uh, insist on the 3,000-page report that has never been released following the, that was an investigation that was done by PwC, and it remains a disgrace that that report's never been released. Mm -hmm. uh, 11 pages was released at the time, and for me that should, you know, that should happen as, yeah, as quickly as possible, and one should see what comes out of that. But I'd, I hope that this isn't the end of it, just to sort of see who else might have been implicated. The Germans, they wanted him taken there in order to answer to these alleged crimes. Your thoughts about whether that leg of the case is possibly in jeopardy? Who knows? Um, I, 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 don't, look, they, I don't think they had a lot of information themselves. They would have hoped to have get him on the stand to ask him some questions. But I, I really, I'm, I'm quite shocked that this happened today because I, I, it, I always felt he was in control of the situation. He never spoke to anybody. He only appeared in public once. He was in Parliament. Um, I think it was in 2018, September that year. It was the only time he really said anything publicly about what happened. So he never really got the sense he was really under pressure to spill the beans. Maybe the German authorities started um, putting pressure on him, but I, I didn't really get that sense either, I've got to be honest. I, I wonder if, he's, if he was running out of money, if that might have been behind this. You know, if you start running out of money, your assets have been frozen by the Reserve Bank, uh, maybe, maybe that might have put the pressure where the authorities uh, weren't able to do it. Um, but, but, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Let's then try and remind the viewers in broad strokes, James, about the book that you wrote, The Biggest Corporate Crash. Just quick highlights about what you were able to detail about the Steinhoff scandal. <laughs> Tony, you're catching me uh, quite off guard. I've got to be honest. I was I was quite surprised by by this when I got a call a few minutes ago. So I've got to gather my thoughts. I mean, in in essence, 2017, we all woke up in December the 4th or the 5th that uh, the Steinoff that Marcus that uh, Marcus Joste had resigned as the CEO of Steinoff, 
And it just led to the share price going off a cliff. It fell to one stage, I think it fell to about, um, I think it was about two rand. And at one stage, that share was 96 rand. So that shows you the, the value that had been wiped out. So about 200 billion, as you mentioned. Um, and it was, it was sort of characterized by a lot of uncertainty. How was this possible? You know, you've, you've got a company that was a darling on the JSE, one of the top 10 most valuable companies on the JSE. Mm-hmm. And um, so many investors, about 20 billion was lost by the government employees' pension fund. So that's your, your blue collar workers. So a massive crash just happened very suddenly. And I think that was the, what, what, what interested me. So when I started looking into this book, you started realizing how what these guys were doing, they were buying dud companies at a very overvalued price. So you'd pay, for, for example, you'd pay 1,000 Rand for a company that's only worth about 100 Rand. So your balance sheet looks very strong but it's only in intangible assets because the value is overinflated. So it's a way of, of going and loaning more money to, to buy a lot of things very quickly. And it was just a, a cooking of the books, to put it quite, quite basic or quite bluntly. But it, the way that, that he was able to pull the veil over the wool over everybody's eyes, I mean, you had very clever people on that board. You had three guys with doctorates in, um, in accounting. You had uh, Christo Visa was the chairman of the board. Um, uh, and various others. Johan van Sale from Sunnam was on that board. Steve Boyson from APSA was on that board. It was a very strong board, and none of them apparently saw this coming. So I think that was what was really interesting. But the, the main thing which, which really grates me is that the in-depth investigation into what happened, a 3,000-page report was never released and has never been released. And, you know, until that's been done, I think a lot of what we're doing is still, is still guesswork. Yeah. I, I suppose... James, you can't speak for people like Christo Visse because that's one individual, as you say, he was chair of the board. They never saw this coming. He subsequently says he lost billions of rand on the back of this scandal. How, how do you think they feeling tonight? Look, I suppose they're, they've, they've always had a lot of questions. I'd, I'd, uh, I, as far as I understand the... Uh, Christo Visa hasn't had any contact with Marcus Eustig for the past four or five years. So Eustig definitely went into a reclusive lifestyle. I mean, he wasn't really seen in public. He retreated to his mansion in, uh, in Armanus. It's about two hours' drive from Cape Town. Um, and was rarely seen in public. I mean, you know, a guy with as prominent figure as he, if you, you know, you'd, you'd imagine you'd have seen a lot more photos of him mm. in public, sort of like uh, this Princess Kate story. He just disappeared. Um, so I don't know how they'd be feeling, to be honest. They probably feel a bit of a sense of shock. It sort of a, draws a line under a, a messy business. Uh, these guys who were personally involved, like Visa, who did lose a lot of money and certainly had some answers and was probably hoping to get some, uh, some payback in some form or other. If it was seeing used to behind bars, that might have been one way. Might feel cheated out of that now. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know. I, you know. I can't speak on their behalf. As we taper down... The South African authorities, law enforcement, how they have handled this investigation, or perhaps is that giving them too much credit? Uh, I spoke to the minister just, uh, I think it was Monday, if not Tuesday, and he expressed his disappointment. This is the minister of justice, Ronald Lamula, expressing disappointment about how there's just been a lack of movement on this case and actually urging the NPA to come out and update the public as to what's going on with this investigation and look at what's happened today. Yeah. So so your question is whether the authorities have been doing a good job. Is that your question? That is exactly the question. Yeah. The the answer is no, they haven't. I think they've been abysmal. They remain abysmal. But, I mean, you know, we don't have to bang that drum too often. We know this is a fact. Uh, I've, you know, when I investigated this the first time, this is now five, six years ago, 2017. Um, the, you know, we've got, we've got the, you've got the Hawks, and then you've got the Commercial Crimes Unit, who's supposed to be staffed by experts, forensic experts, computer experts, tax experts. At the time, they didn't even have a CA in service. I don't think they had a fully functioning team uh, in service. And I am informed this remains very much the case at the moment. If you don't have those specialists in your most <laughs> your, your, your most important uh, law enforcement entity, you can't put a normal cop 
with great respect uh, onto investigation, investigating a massively complex corporate fraud case like this. You can't. You need experts who are able to look into the computer records, who understand financial accounting systems, who understand international law implications, understand listing implications, uh, mergers, acquisitions, and I'm afraid we just don't have those skills uh, in our enforcement services. And without that, things are going to stall and it's going to take forever, which has been the case. I mean, you can't build a case against someone if you don't have the evidence, and I don't think we've got the ability to gather the evidence. So a lot of – there's a lot of other things going on as well with other companies. I think of Tongat Hewlett, for example, where there were similar, similar happenings. And, you know, nothing ever really comes of it because yeah. I just don't think we've got the capacity to really look into it properly. How important is it, therefore, my last question to you, how important is it that the Hawks, who were the lead on this investigation – come out this evening and tell the public the events leading up to what we understand to be Marcus Joste taking his own life? I mean, very important. Uh, we, I don't have a lot of the details of what happened this afternoon. It would be interesting to see. Um, I mean, it would be important and interesting to see what happened. I, um, I, I don't have enough details to really speculate on, on, on that, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Full disclosure is always always the first uh, place to start, and from the beginning, this case has been uh, characterised by as little uh, transparency as, as possible. And a lot of it, you know, again, I go back to that 3,000-page report, which is just I don't understand how our government and our authorities just allow it to be that there's a report into the ongoings and the wrong wrong being wrongdoings here, and it's just been allowed to be squashed and to to be hidden away in. And an 11-page report gets released, and we must be happy with that. I don't think that's acceptable. So, uh, full transparency is the only way that you, uh, you, you know, you, uh, you, you, what's the word? You shake out the cobwebs and you clean the cupboards, and we would <laughs> certainly hope for that. Uh, yeah. We would certainly hope for that. James Brentstein, let me thank you very much for affording us your time at such short notice.